I'm going to get a carrier pigeon <laughs> because all those other ways are stupid by comparison. <laughs> What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. True or false? I wholeheartedly agree with that statement that A.W. Tozer said. I, I think there's nothing more critical for us than who we think God is. In fact, I would say it shapes everything. If I want to understand how you live your life or how you don't live your life or what's driving you, the main thing that I need to understand about you or you need to understand about me is what is it that I think God is like. And so last week, Pastor Jeremy began a short series, a three-part series that fits because it's on the Trinity, right? Out of order, we know, right? Talking about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And so I hope Uh, We've received some really good feedback. I know lots of you were uh, really moved by that sermon, which is really an introductory sermon on the person of the Holy Spirit. There's a whole lot more uh, that we need to unpack over the years that come. But this morning we want to look at the Father. But before we do that, I want us to review, if we can, just for a second, the doctrine of the Trinity. As Jeremy said last week, the word Trinity is not in your Bible. Don't look in the concordance. It's not there. But certainly the concept is, and here's the concept of the Trinity that the Bible teaches. There is one God. Deuteronomy 6, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, he is one. And this one God has eternally existed. Now that word eternally, just think think deeply about that until it hurts. Okay? Eternally, we can't even fathom that. He has eternally existed, this one God in three distinct persons or as three distinct persons. And when we say persons in the Godhead, we don't mean persons like people. God is spirit. What we mean is there are three distinct persons, personalities, individuals, if you will, within the one Godhead, and that these three, all of which are God, have eternally existed together in a unique relationship, and they are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit within the one God. All three persons are fully God. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is also God. All are equal in power and glory. That's not controversial today. We're talking about the Father. You don't ever hear people disputing whether the Father is all-powerful. That's pertaining more to the Son and the Spirit. But these three have always existed. This is what I want to draw our attention to. These three have always existed in perfect love, unity, and agreement. And you could use synonyms to those. What I'm trying to say is these three persons in the Godhead have always existed in a unique relationship that you and I have never seen. The best marriage in the room this morning, right? There's probably a couple that's been married 50 years and you've grown so close, right? They always say that you start to resemble one another, right? That that unity that might exist in the best marriage here is not even close. The Godhead has always existed in this perfect relationship of unity such that there is no competition. There's never a disagreement among the members of the Trinity. So we never have the case that the Father says, well, I think we ought to. And the Son and the Spirit say, no. (laughs) Or the Son says, hey, I've got an idea. And the Father and the Spirit say, no. They're not taking votes. Does that make sense? It's hard to fathom because it's someone that we've never seen. But the Trinity has existed in this unique relationship from eternity past. And every time since time began, when the Godhead decided to create all things, they've always worked in perfect harmony with one another. So at the creation, you've got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together working with a common purpose and a goal, all in perfect agreement, all participating in the creation of all things. At the incarnation, you don't have the Son who says, oh, hey, I'll go be the Savior of mankind, and a Father who is somehow 
hesitant or has to think about that for a while. The Bible is very clear. God sent his son. And yet it also says Jesus willingly came. And it also says he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So in the incarnation, you have all three persons in the Godhead perfectly working in harmony. Always the case. This is a critical idea. Always that is the case. In redemption, when you think about the Son and his death on the cross, what you don't have is the Son who deeply loves us, who goes to a cross and who demonstrates his love in laying his life down as an atonement for our sin with a Father who is primarily wrathful. That's very common in evangelical theology. That's, I'm challenging that this morning. That's not really what's going on. All persons in the Godhead are equally seeing to it that we, as loved ones of God, will be redeemed. And they all have different roles to play within that scene that we see at Calvary. But I guarantee you the Father is in no way hesitant. The Father is driving it, if you will. The Son is willingly going and the Spirit is empowering him to do it and raising him from the dead. So you don't ever have the case that the Son is sort of the hero of the Godhead as opposed to the Father. That just doesn't happen. The Father loves you and I as much as the Son loves you and I, as much as the Spirit loves you and I. And this morning we want to unpack Psalm 103. We want to use that as our text. But before we do that, I'd like to pray and ask uh, the Lord to show himself to us through this text. Father, this text is about you. And many of us have a lot of misconceptions about you. And so I pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself to us this morning. I confess my inadequacy to explain who you are, and I depend instead upon the ministry of the Holy Spirit to illuminate hearts and minds. Jesus, we ask that you would pray for us from the right hand of the Father. You're right there at his right hand, interceding for us now. And so we ask you, if you would, please pray for us as we seek to see the Father in this text of Scripture. Father, reveal yourself to our hearts in a powerful and a fresh way this morning, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 103, I believe with all my heart, is properly understood as a psalm that describes, a psalm of David that describes who our Father is. So who do you think God the Father is? What do you think he's like? I'm suggesting this morning that Psalm 103 can reframe the way that you think God the Father is. We shouldn't understand passages in the Scripture as sort of generically about God. What we should understand is when the Bible is talking about God, it is talking, if it doesn't mention the Son or the Spirit, primarily about our Father. And so this text in Psalm 103, which begins, as we've already sung, Bless the Lord, O my soul, That word Lord, if you look in your Bible, I'm going to read from the NLT, you'll see that the word Lord is all capitalized, L-O-R-D, capital. What the translators are doing is they're translating the Hebrew Y-H-V-H. Sometimes we say Yahweh or Jehovah. There are no vowels. We don't know how they pronounced it. This is the official name of God, and I want to suggest that this passage is showing us God the Father. Bless Yahweh, bless the Father, O my soul. As the NLT goes on, with my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise Yahweh. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death, crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things, my youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses, perhaps Exodus 33 is in mind, and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord, Yahweh, is compassionate and merciful, 
slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He's removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. He knows how weak we are. He remembers we're only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflowers. We bloom and die. The wind blows and we are gone as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments. The Lord has made the heavens his throne, and from there he rules over everything. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord, everything he has created, everything in all his kingdom. Let all that I am Praise the Lord. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. This psalm is a description of our father. And in verse 13, the psalmist David refers to him and he says, the Lord is like a father and like a father. He has compassion toward his children. There's an analogy that David is writing into this psalm. And I want to make sure we understand that it goes the right direction. Lots of us in this room, when we think of Father, that's a warm and a fuzzy and a wonderful thought. And that's a great blessing if that's true of you. Some of us in this room might think about Father and it may not be so warm or so fuzzy. It might be kind of murky or might be harsh. It might be who knows what. But all of us are bringing to this idea of Father some sort of experience And I want us to understand this morning that the analogy in terms of God as Father, God the Father, has to go in the right direction. We don't take the best that we could see in Father, in terms of earthly Father, and then say, oh, well, God's kind of like that. That's going backwards. The best earthly Father is like God in a small way. God's fatherhood is infinite. It's infinitely better than anything we've ever seen or experienced. And so we can't take our experience in earthly terms of father and then say, oh, that's what God is like. I know David says he's compassionate. You'll see this in a moment. Instead, we've got to recognize the father as he's revealed himself to us. In Scripture, in fact, a big goal of our lives, quite frankly, is trying to understand and unpack that truth. That's a life-changing truth. The fact that in Christ we've been brought into a relationship with a new father and a new family. A father who loves us in the way that David will describe. If we don't go in the right direction, my concern is that God the Father will be emotionally unrecognizable to us. We won't recognize him appropriately. So what we've got to notice in this text is the way the Holy Spirit inspires David to describe God the Father. This is what the Father is like according to the Scripture. This Lord, Yahweh, the Father, is the one who does all these great things. The first seven verses of Psalm 103 describe the things that he does. It's a list. He forgives all our iniquities. He heals all our diseases. He redeems our life from the pit. He crowns our life. He satisfies us. He defends us. He executes righteousness. And lastly, he reveals himself to us just like he did to Moses. God's doing all these things. And yet, for those of you that are insurance people in the room, why is it on those policies that you have us all sign? It refers to this weird thing called acts of God. And none of them are good. (laughs) An act of God in my insurance policy is a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake. And I think what David's doing in the psalm is he's saying like, whoa, 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 whoa. These are the acts of God that you and I ought to be looking at. 
And what he's not saying, I also believe, as some in the church have tried to say, well, it says he heals all your diseases. So then you get in this weird theology, which at some point, frankly, becomes abusive. Well, you're not healed because you're not. Well, that's nonsense. God heals our diseases every time we get healed. He doesn't heal all our diseases or we would never die, right? We're all going to die of something, probably. Um, old age, but old age has symptoms that go with it. So he's not literally healing all, all of our diseases. What, what the psalmist is trying to say, if you track with me, he's saying if we are healed, we ought rightly to attribute the healing to God the Father. If we are forgiven, we ought to attribute that to God the Father. If I'm satisfied, if my life is full of good things, whatever those things are, I should be saying, oh, that's evidence that my Father loves me. So we're not just getting sort of naturally healed. Uh, My family was teasing me. We're in California. I had a cold. I'm a terrible sick person. I'm a baby. So all week long I'm saying, that was the joke, I'm pretty sick. You know, then finally Abby gets sick and then she starts saying, I'm pretty sick. So I don't have a cold anymore. Praise God. Well, what I'm telling you today is, yes, I understand God designed my body to fight off all that stuff. But I think biblically it is true that I can attribute the fact that I'm healed from that to my father. He healed me. Just like he forgives my sins and satisfies my life every time there's a sunset that's beautiful or I have a a wonderful meal, anything good, what we're supposed to be doing, this is what David's saying, don't forget all his benefits. So why are we so quick to attribute the bad stuff, those acts of God, to God, and yet we don't attribute the good things to our Father who loves us? So you can see, David's challenging where we live. That's right where the rubber meets the road. Why, when I get pulled over in the church van for going too fast... Do I say, Lord, why? Why is that cop there? I got a warning. He only got, he only got a warning. <laughs> but when something good happens to me, I don't say, oh, Potter, that's you. It's you. Again and again and again and again. What does James say? Every good and perfect gift comes from who? The Father, Right? So this is what the psalmist David is saying. He's saying, no, we've got to notice in God's acts, this is what God is like. He's constantly doing these wonderful things for us. Yes, the world has suffering. Yes, there's a problem of evil. But don't miss the point that God the Father in the midst of this fallen world is showing his love to us all the time. But then the psalmist moves on, verses 8 through 10, and he gets a little more specific. So we can talk about what somebody does, but when I start talking about who somebody is, now I'm really getting down to the the core of it. And so the psalmist says about the Lord some things that are really important. Notice with me verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Let me unpack that a little bit. The psalmist is using three terms in Hebrew to describe the Father and then one term to describe how he's not. So let me start with positively. What is he like? The first word in the NLT is is compassionate. That's a decent translation. The word in Hebrew is rachum. You can say that. That's fun to say, right? Rachum. And it comes from the word rahen, which means womb. So you ladies will get this better than the men, okay? You can explain it to him later. This is a term used to describe the feelings that one has sort of naturally and instinctively toward their offspring. I know it's always harder for us men, right? We're not as intimately connected to the pregnancy. And then all of a sudden this human being is ours and we hold them in our hands and we say, that's mine. And our wives have already been bonding with that child for months. This is the compassion that he's describing here. The Lord, first and foremost, is compassionate. Is that the first thing you would have written on your bulletin? I think my father is first and foremost compassionate. So I would suggest if that's not the case, then maybe you need to keep listening to what David has to say. 
The Lord is compassionate. The Lord has a deep love rooted in a natural bond. It's kind of a motherly love, frankly. Not getting into that. God is spirit. God doesn't have gender. But God the Father is motherly in his compassion. That word is used infrequently of human beings, but when it is used, it's used either of someone's compassion toward a small baby or someone who's helpless. So that's first what God is. Secondly, God is merciful. Another Hebrew word, chanun, comes from the word chain. Got to clear my throat anyway. The word chain in Hebrew is very similar to the word charis in Greek. So, rewind the tape, whenever that was. We talked about that not too long ago. It means, chain means literally to bend or to incline towards. So God is first compassionate. Secondly, he's gracious or merciful, leaning toward us. And then thirdly, in a positive sense, he is filled with something the NLT here calls unfailing love. The word in Hebrew is hesed. Hesed is covenant love. It, it's hard to define, sort of. It's not just loving kindness as it's translated a lot of times. It always occurs in the context of a relationship. You notice in, in this psalm, several times David said, the Lord has this kind of love toward who? Those who fear him. Those who obey him. Those who are in this relationship with him. So it's true, God the Father loves all people. But what he's describing here is a special love within the relationship. Those who are in Christ, those who are in the family, experience this hesed. And I think the best way perhaps to translate hesed is loyalty. God is intensely loyal toward his own. He is for us. Now that may or may not square with your emotional experience connected to the word father. But this is who God is. This is who the Father is. This is who he, he describes himself to be. And then just to take it even further, he's those three things, but he's also slow, David says, to get angry. He's not quick-tempered. The word in Hebrew for anger is to flare the nostrils. He, he's, he's not a rager. Psalm 30, verse 5 is relevant to this discussion. It says, his anger lasts but a moment. And that word there, moment, is riga in Hebrew. It's like a Hebrew lesson, sorry. Which comes from the Hebrew word for foot, which means somehow his anger is, I mean, that didn't last too long, right? Stomp, dissipate. God does have anger. Can we settle that? It's not controversial. God isn't winking at sin or just indifferent. I mean, God is angry over all kinds of things you could imagine, right? When God observes injustice, he's angry. But God is not living in this perpetual state of anger. Some of us have a concept of God the Father almost like he's just constantly raging And if it weren't for the sun and the cross kind of holding back his rage, where would we be? This text challenges that theology. That's not who God is described here as. The father is slow to get angry. And when he is angry, his anger lasts a moment like a foot stomp. He goes on to say in verse 9, he will not constantly or perpetually accuse us. God is not a perpetual accuser. He's not a list keeper or a grudge holder. That's not who our Father is. He's not like that. So if we think He's like that, we are simply mistaken. Nor, verse 9b, will He remain angry forever. Literally in the Hebrew it says He doesn't hold on to His anger. Have you noticed that? You have to kind of nurse a grudge. We have that expression in English, right? If you don't keep rehearsing it, it's hard to stay angry. God's not a grudge nurser. He's not rehearsing. That's not, that's not his disposition toward us, his children that he loves, that he has compassion toward, and that he has this hesed, this deep loyalty toward. He doesn't retaliate, verse 10. He doesn't punish us for all of our sins. Thank the Lord he doesn't. 
He doesn't deal harshly with us as we deserve. He's not tit for tat. Our Father isn't like that. I mean, you're catching the gist of this, and I'm not making this up. This is inspired scripture. This is what God, through David, says he's like. The Father is like this. The Father is compassionate. The Father is gracious. The Father has deep hased, this covenant loyalty toward us. He's not quick-tempered. He's not living in anger toward us. That's not his disposition. Instead, here the psalmist, David, goes on to, to contrast it. Verse 11, he doesn't deal harshly. No, his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. How do I describe this, David, I'm sure, is thinking? Lord, I don't know how to use language to describe how great your love for us is, how deep your hased is. It's high as the heavens are above the earth. So go out tonight and look at where the stars are and compute the distance. That's the difference. That's how high God's hased. That's how deep his compassion is. The distance is huge beyond what we think he's like and what he really is like. So I would say it's going to take a lifetime for us to even begin to comprehend. And even then it won't be fully. Someday, somehow, some way, we'll see him. And that'll be an amazing transformation. His unfailing love is higher than the height of the heavens above the earth. And then he uses another metaphor. He says, the, our sin has been removed as far as east is from west. In other words, as far as one pole could possibly be from the other. And we've heard these verses, so they lose their power. Think about them afresh this morning. That's, that's amazing. He's not holding a list against us. Colossians is very clear. He took the list that was against us, that was contrary to us, and he nailed it to a cross, and it's gone. It's paid. In the person of the Son, our debt is fully paid, and now, Romans 5, we have peace with God. With God who? God the Father. There's no enmity. We've been fully justified in Christ, and so the Father is in a relationship which is only characterized like Psalm 103 describes it. He loves us like children. He has compassion toward us. He is merciful. And so David, you can see, is saying, like, how do I describe this? And then the last thing he tries to contrast is the, the idea of time. Our lives are fairly short, right? The psalm said, we're like a flower of the field. We come and we go. The best of us with the best medical care, I mean, I don't know what we can live to. 120, maybe? Most of us don't make it that far, right, Jackie? But if we live 90 years, if we live 100 years, that's a long life. And what David is saying is, Contrast that with God's said, which is from everlasting to everlasting. Like one everlasting would have been enough. He said twice. So what in the world is one everlasting to another one? It's like David is trying to say, like, you guys need to understand. This is who Yahweh, God the Father, is. This is what he's like. And if you've heard otherwise, then please be corrected and please receive it and, and embrace it because the thoughts that come into our mind when we think about God are the most important thing about us. The thoughts that come into our mind when we think about God the Father are the most important thing about us. Who do you think he is? What do you think he's like? That will shape your life. And if you can move your concept of who your father is, your life will be much more consistent with his heart's desire for you and for me. You see, the whole point is that the doctrine of the Trinity isn't just this, oh yeah, we do that for kids in catechism when they're 12, and then we kind of set that aside. The doctrine of the Trinity, many have argued, I agree with this, it's the central doctrine of the Bible, that's who God is, and it's what what's God is what's that was bad English. It's what God is doing 
It's all tied into the doctrine of the Trinity. God, in three persons, determined not only to create us, but knowing that we would fall to redeem us. And so by the death of his son, God has brought us into a relationship with him that is just as dear and intimate as the relationship that they share as the Trinity. Does that make sense? I mean, it can't make full sense, right? But do you compute that? That's not comprehensible. You can't grasp that, how wide, how deep, how loved the, God, the, the, the love of God is for us. We can't grab it. And so David, like other Bible writers, is trying to describe it in these terms. Higher than the heavens, further from east and west, everlasting to everlasting. This is who God the Father is. And this is who God the Father wants us to understand him to be. He couldn't be closer to us than he is. So there's a word for God that shows up in the New Testament. That word up on top of that slide, Abba. That is not a Swedish rock band. (laughs) They stole it. And their music is sort of, right? <laughs> Any fans of ABBA that are willing to admit it? There's a few. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> they just made a movie, right? Meryl Streep just did the movie about the whole thing. <laughs> ABBA is a word that shows up in the New Testament to help us, I think, understand what God's trying to say. The, the word in, in Hebrew... Without the B-A on the end, just A-B, Ab, you actually pronounce it Av, just means father. So Abba is very similar to our English version of dad, which goes to daddy. So I was thinking that. I think that's a legitimate point to make. Jim and Dory are in Israel today, and they may well overhear a child running through the street who can't find his or her father saying Abba. That's what a little kid would say even today in Israel. Daddy, where are you? And so God in the New Testament chooses to reveal himself to us under this intimate name of Daddy, Abba. And it's by the Holy Spirit. Paul writes that in Romans that we cry out, Abba. We're brought into this relationship. Remember Jesus said things like you've got to become like a child. So we've got to become a child in this relationship to Abba to experience and to receive and to allow that deep love and compassion and has said that our Father has for us to sink in and change the people that we are. So I've composed a prayer, and let me just preface this by saying the, the downside with liturgical prayers when you go to churches where the prayers are written and you repeat after me. The thing I don't like about that is it's putting words in your mouth, which may or may not be genuine for you. So I'm not going to do that this morning. I wrote this prayer coming out of this sermon. And what I'm going to do as Jeremy and and, uh, Luke play, I'm just going to scroll through the slides. This is a prayer that I wrote. This would represent my heart, my desire toward my father. And if the shoe fits, then feel free to wear it. You don't have to say it out loud, but you can. There's freedom in this place. You can say it out loud if you want. You can say it in your heart. The thing I'm after this morning is, to whatever extent you feel comfortable, can you use this prayer to guide you into a prayer toward your Father, recognizing that that relationship with your Father is a a critical relationship, the deepest of all relationships, in fact. And so... I'm just going to be quiet and we'll scroll through.
John said, Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. That's who our Father is. My prayer this morning is that Psalm 103 will forever frame your view of who your Father is. When you're discouraged, when you doubt, when you're troubled, I pray that you go back and reread that again and again and again and let it sink in. This is who the Father is. As Jim says often, he is crazy about us. It's true. So now receive the benediction. Now to him. Who do you think the him is? The Father. Look at the text. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys.